Um, we were married for 21 years and have led groups most of that most of that time and, and know so much of, of our own development as far as in the faith has happened because of us being in a group. So that what I want to share really is just how people in your group grow. And this comes from uh, a book that I wrote with uh, a couple of friends, Michael Kelly and, and Philip Nation, but it really came from this, this, um, this really massive research project. We believe uh, one of the largest research projects done on how, how people grow, how they develop and how they mature. And, and what you'll see is a lot of it really does have an impact on the reality of being in community in a class. So I just want you to think about people as we talk about this for the next little bit and I'll uh, take, hopefully get some time for questions. Think about some of the people in your class. So, um, you know, my wife and I, I I've, I've started, I'm doing a lot of interim preaching right now, so we're not leading a Sunday school class now, but the last one we, we led was a group of young, young married couples. And, um, you know, they're, they're, people were at different stages of, uh, in their journey. You had, you had um, the, the couple where the, you could tell the wife was kind of dragging the husband along. Um, you had other couples where the husband was the spiritual leader at the house. You know, you had other couples that were brand new to the faith, some that were even not sure if they were Christian or not, if they just kind of grew up in church. Uh, and so it's really uh, it's a challenge to lead a, a, a group of people because every group is really – it's really unique because all the people in that group are unique. So as we, as we go through this, think about the different people in the class that you're, that you're shepherding. So here's what we found. And you see truth posture leaders. You've seen these Venn diagrams before, but we, we call the middle section there where truth posture and leaders all intersect together. We call that the transformational sweet spot. And that's where it's like a, the sweet spot on a, on a racket or on a, on a bat. It's, you're not guaranteed that it's going to be a home run. You're not guaranteed that it's going to be a great, uh, going, to, going to for sure be a, a perfect hit over the net. But it's the sweet spot. It's, it's where transformation is likely, likely to happen. So it's, it's really the combination of, of three things, truth, posture, and, and leaders. So here's where transformation is most likely to take place is when People encounter the truth of God while they're in a teachable posture and they encounter that truth through godly leaders. So this research project we're part of, and there's so many stories that we interacted with of, of people who, um, you know, the, the guy who's like 35 and went, went to church every single week, but, uh, you know, he, it wasn't necessarily something that he, he owned his faith and, and really it just was like a thing, you know, checklist kind of, kind of faith. And then he goes on a mission trip with um, his high school class. And on this mission trip, he sees things he's never seen before. Uh, he thought success is, you know, I graduated college and, and, and had a, you know, a two-bedroom condo and then, then got married, moved to a three-bedroom, two-bath house, and then got a promotion, moved to a four-bedroom, three-bath house, and then got another promotion. And, man, now I'm in a five-bedroom house. and then. This next jump that I make, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be the dream house that I'm going to retire in. So he, he's living that life, uh, and he goes, he's miserable, and he goes on a mission trip with people from his high school class and sees things he never saw before, people who have way less than he has, and he's blown away that they have joy that he, he's never tasted before. And so he's laying in, in a hammock at night with other guys from his Sunday school class and they apply the truth of God to him. He sees in them uh, the faith that he just mentally had, but didn't really didn't own. And it transformation takes place. It's truth. The, the, the mission trip put him in a posture. The truth was applied to his heart while he was in a teachable posture and it was applied by, by God, the leaders. Or it's the, and this is, this is common. It's the lady who's um, in a Sunday school class and her husband leaves her, or her, uh, she finds out her husband's diagnosed with stage four cancer, and all of a sudden she's in this very broken, vulnerable posture. And we don't want to cause those trials at all. I mean, we don't. We hate those trials. We hate the trials of a broken and fallen and fragile world. But the Lord says in James and the First Peter that He uses trials to to mature us and bring us to Himself. So. This trial, this, the pain of this moment awakens her, and there's a, 
lady from her Sunday school class that every Tuesday takes her coffee and applies the truth of God to her heart while she's in a teachable posture. And that's when, that's when her spiritual journey just really takes off. So it was, it was just tons of uh, interactions like that that shows it's really the intersection of truth, posture, and leader. So I just want to talk about each of these real quickly. And I'll, I'm just going to hit gospel when it, comes, uh, when it comes to truth. And so one of the things, anytime I would um, train group leaders or school teachers, anytime you're, you, were, you were teaching and preparing, uh, there is a, theologians will say when you read the Bible that, that you have the imperative and then you, the imperatives of the Bible and then you have the indicative of the Bible. So imperatives are commands and the Bible's, the Bible's filled with them. So the Sunday school class, my wife Kay and I led, I mean, I want the guys in, in my Sunday school class to love their wives. It's a command in the Bible. Husbands, love your wives. Um, I want the guys in my Sunday school class to accept one another. Um, I want them to give. I want them to share the gospel. And these are commands. These are imperatives in the Bible. But when you read the, the narrative of Scripture, it's, it's fascinating that any time the apostle is given an imperative, a command, they always root that imperative in the indicative. The indicative is not what we do, but it's what, it's what it's been done for us. It's a past action, what was done for us by Christ. And so if you, as a leader, when you teach, and, and you must teach the imperatives, the commands of Scripture. But if you don't root those commands in the indicative and in what Christ has done, then people who come to your Sunday school class, it will feel real quickly like a list of things to do without the power to actually live them out because my heart's not being refreshed with the grace of Jesus, with the indicative, with what Christ has done. And so just, just real quickly, I'll, I'll ask for a little bit of feedback because I can't tell if you all track or not. So I'll give, a, I'll give um, an example of, of, a, of a scripture, and, and you tell me if it's, which part's imperative and which part's indicative. So Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives. Imperative or indicative? Uh, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Indicative. So, I mean, it's really fascinating that Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus. It's normal in that culture for people to be married for social appearance, but, but, but not be committed in a monogamous relationship. And he doesn't even address the culture. He says, um, husbands, here's the deal, man. If you're not loving your wife, uh, he says it, love your wife, but you're not going to have the power to love her the way you should, unless your heart is just overwhelmed with the reality that Christ, that Christ loved you. So love your wife imperative as Christ loved you. And as a pastor for many years, I'd have so many guys, I, I pastored Miami before um, moving to Nashville to become one of the vice presidents at, at Lifeway. And so a lot of, a lot of guys that I would pastor there would be like, bro, you don't know. Um, it's easy for you to say you have a great marriage, but you don't know how she is. You, you don't know how she's talked about me and from my mother-in-law. Uh, you, you don't know how she's gotten cold towards me and how our relationship's cold and distant and you don't know. And, and I would, I would just say, man, how, how warm were you to the Lord when he pursued you and, and went after you and went after your heart. Uh, so that, that's what Paul's saying in Ephesians 5. He's saying, man, you let your heart be overwhelmed with how Christ loved you. And then you're going to love you're going, to, you're going to love your wife. So imperative has got to be rooted in the indicative or the people who come to the group, to the class, it's going to feel like just a list and it's not going to bring, it's not going to bring about transformation. Here's another example. We want, we want, um, we want our people to be generous and first Houston is known as a generous church. So I, I know this is a value for you. Paul says, uh, St. Corinthians day, he writes the church of Corinth and he says, um, just as you excel in these things, excel in the grace of giving. So excel in the grace of giving. Is that an imperative or an indicative? Imperative. That's verse 7. Then, then he says in verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Indicative. So I, it's, it's kind of like in a, in a church, if the offering plate's passing, it's like Paul is essentially saying, man, if you aren't compelled to give, 
just sit there and think about what Jesus did for you, how he was rich, and for you, he became poor, so that through his poverty, you might become, you might become rich. So imperative rooted in the, in the, in the indicative. So someone has said this before. If you give the imperatives without the indicative, it's impossible. So this is why transformation has to be rooted in the gospel. If you give the imperatives, so just think about all the times you teach a class. If you give the imperatives without reminding the, the people of the indicative, what Christ has done, it's impossible. It's impossible for me to live it out because, my, my, you know, we sing the hymn, prone to wonder what I feel it, prone to lo- leave the God I love. My heart is so prone to wander away from the grace of God. And so if I have imperatives given to me without reminding me of who Jesus is and what he's done, I, I, can't, it's imp- I can't live it out. There's so many more, I won't, I won't spend more time on them, but I mean, think about it. Forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. Accept one another as Christ has accepted you. Um, there's so many. In, in, in the, you just see this rhythm, this holy rhythm in the Bible of imperative, rooted in the indicative. And I'm concerned that, that people could go to a, a Sunday school class. I'm just concerned that I could teach. And I've taught a bunch of Sunday school classes. Um, when I was a pastor, I taught a science class. I mean, I, it's, it's, it matters to me. What you do matters to me. But it, can, it, 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 can, it concerns me that I could, uh, I could give imperatives without reminding people of what Christ has done. And what we do when we do that is we, we give them a new law without the ability to actually live it out because law, leads, law just leads to our condemnation. It doesn't, it doesn't lead to, to our transformation. All right, so first is... First is truth. And let, let me, when I say discipleship, let me, let me back up before we get to posture and leaders real quickly and give you the definition that, that we operate from when we talk about discipleship because it's, a, it's, a, it's an important word. And I'm grateful that church leaders are talking more about discipleship. But if we're not careful, it can be like a junk drawer term, right? Right in the, my kitchen right over there, we have a junk drawer. So there's like Chuck E. Cheese tickets, there's uh, like a ruler. There's like some hair pieces from my daughters. It's, it's, it's like if you don't know where it goes, it goes in the junk drawer. And I'm sure you've got a junk drawer at, that, at the house too. And if we're not careful, discipleship can become a junk drawer term. Ah, I don't know what it means. So discipleship, let's just, let's just throw that in there. So we want to be, be clear on what we're, we're talking about when we say the word discipleship. So here's the definition I'm operating from. Discipleship is neither information nor behavioral modification, but it's ultimately transformation. And so I'll try to unpack that real quickly. Discipleship's not information or behavioral modification, but ultimately transformation. So listen, you know this. Um, you're, you're at a great church that teaches the, the scripture exceptionally well. And so I know you know this. I just want to remind us. Discipleship not being information is really important. If, if discipleship was information, the scripture says that the, the demons would be disciples. James 2.19, you believe there's one God, good, but even the demons believe that and they show it. And why that's important for a Sunday school teacher, Sunday school director, is if you think discipleship is only information, then the goal of a class is to just get people to know stuff. And if, if, if all, all we're doing is getting people to know stuff, we're not necessarily making disciples. Now, a disciple longs to know, right? I mean, I, I, one of the reasons I know I'm a Christian is because I, is I love the word and I want to know him more and I want to I seek him. That's, how, that's one of the reasons I know I'm a Christian. But knowing information alone is not, is not discipleship. So discipleship is not information. Uh, it's also not behavioral modification. And sometimes if people grew up in a church that was just information, they, they were in worship services that there were like diagrams of the Temple Mount and uh, Greek words like crazy, but they saw people not actually living anything out, they can swing the pendulum from information over to behavioral modification. And behavioral modification is, um, hey, here's, here's five ways to be a great dad this week. Here's four ways to be a better employee this week. Here's 18 ways to be a better husband and wife this week. And if you're not careful, it can be just a list of all these, these behaviors to modify. 
Uh, you look at the rich young ruler and you see Jesus rejecting him as a disciple because the rich young ruler, man, he'd be an awesome neighbor, a great guy to hang out with, great employee. He wanted Jesus to give him a list. He, he literally goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, tell me what I must do. Give me a list of things to do. Jesus gives him like six of the 10 commandments and says, hey, um, here, do these things. And the guy actually thinks he's done them. I've done all these, Jesus. Just give me, that's what I'm trying to tell you, Jesus. I've done all these. Just give me something else to do for me to have eternal life. And Jesus was giving him those commandments to show him that he didn't keep the commandments, not as a checklist to actually keep them, but to show him that he was unable to keep them in his own ability and he needed, he needed God's grace. But this guy actually believed he could keep all the commandments himself. And so when Jesus says, sell everything and come follow me, Jesus was showing him that, man, you, you think you've kept them, you haven't kept them. Because the first commandment is, you shall have no other God before me, and your money's before me. Sell that and follow me. And I'm showing you, you haven't kept the commandments. And, and the scripture says in Mark 10 that the guy goes away sad because he has great wealth. So this is the guy who would have come to your Sunday school class, rich young ruler would have come to your Sunday school class, longing for you to give him a list of things to do this week. He, he wants a list on his refrigerator so he can check it off and feel like he's a good Christian. That, that's what the original ruler is. And so we have to be careful that we don't make discipleship just about, you know, I'm, do, I'm doing these things. So discipleship, not information, not behavioral modification, it's ultimately transformation. And my favorite verse on transformation we don't, have, we don't have much time, so I won't spend a lot of time unpacking it, but uh, 2 Corinthians 3, incredible passage where, uh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and we with unveiled faces, this is verse 17 and 18, if, if I misquote it, it's from memory, so please forgive me, but um, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and we with unveiled faces are looking at the glory of the Lord as into a, a mirror and are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. Um, so the verse says, we don't transform ourselves as we look at Jesus over and over and over again. We're transformed with ever-increasing glory, meaning we're more like Jesus tomorrow than we're like him today. People in your science school class are more like Jesus a year from now than they are like him today. And that happens as we, as we look at Jesus as a mirror, and we're transformed into the same image we look at, his image. So... It's, it's bigger than behavioral modification discipleship is. It's bigger than information. It's deeper. It's more. It's ultimately transformation. And to give you an illustration of that, of transformation, my, I grew up in New Orleans, and my, um, my parents in high school, they were <laughs> in Chick-fil-A at night. When I was in high school, I loved McDonald's. I, I mean, I loved it. I absolutely craved it. My parents were going to let me have it once a week, and I would I – would, I so badly wanted it all the time. If you had told me there was a time in my life when I could have McDonald's every, every day, I, I'd have thought you were describing the new heaven and the new earth. I mean, I loved McDonald's so much. I wanted it all the time. And then in college, I went to Louisiana Tech in, um, in North Louisiana, and I went on my first global mission trip, and they were told us, whatever you do, don't, um, don't eat McDonald's on this trip in the Yucatan because some of the locals can't afford it, it'll be offensive, and you could get sick because they could wash lettuce and unpurified water. Well, I've, I've always been a, 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 a bit of a rebel, and so a couple of buddies and I snuck out, and we went to McDonald's like, late at night like we weren't supposed to. And I got so sick, man. I'm talking throwing up McDonald's. And I got back to Louisiana Tech. My dorm was close to, the, uh, <laughs> was close to McDonald's, and even just driving by it, I, I mean, I'm like throwing up in my mouth. It was, it, it, I hate, I all of a sudden started to hate what I once loved. So this thing I loved, I started to hate. And then there was a guy, I was serving as a part-time youth pastor in college. And there was this guy at, um, at the church. And he's like, man, I'm so grateful for you serving the kids. I want to take you out for a steak dinner. And he took me to this steak place that um, served, <laughs> I didn't even know about this till then, prime beef filet mignon, prime beef filet mignon. So there's, if you don't know, I'm about to ruin it for you, but there's three different layers of meat. There's select, it's like the lowest quality. It's like the horse trough, the golden corral, select. And then there's choice, which is like uh, outback. And then there's, uh, 
prime. It's like only 2% of all stake in the U.S. is prime. And it's, uh, man, this plate came out 500 degrees, prime filet. I could, I didn't even need a fork. I mean, a, a knife. I could cut it with a straw. It was so tender. I'm like, I could suck this with a, I, I mean, I could cut this with a fork. I could suck this through a straw. It was so tender. And I knew when I had it that night that the, uh, that Ryan's Steakhouse was never going to taste the same for me again. So I started, I started to love what I didn't even know existed. I started to hate what I once loved and love what I didn't even know existed. My taste buds completely transformed. And that's, what, that's really what spiritual transformation is like. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, maybe you've heard a family preached during the Great Awakening um, in, in America. And people asked him after, how do we know if all these people who say they're becoming Christians, how do we know if they're really becoming a Christian? And his famous, um, his famous work, it's, it's a classic. It's, it's not, Christianity Today calls it one of the top 20 classics in the, in the Christian faith. He said in his, um, his classic work, Treaties of Religious Affection, this great quote. He says, the supreme proof of a true conversion, he's not going to say is what they know. So you talk about people in your social class. It's not going to be that they know all this information. He's not going to say, it's look at the list of their behaviors. He says, the supreme proof of a true conversion is holy affections. I love that. Holy affections. Longings after God. Longings after purity. Longings after holiness. And so that's transformation is when the affections of the people in my group, in my class change. And it's not just a one-time change, but as we walk with Jesus and keep looking at him, our affections keep changing over over and over again. So to do that, number one, truth. All right, number two, posture. I'll hit posture leader and leaders in the next seven minutes to get to get you guys done here by seven seven thirty, which I know is the time alive. We talk about a lot of things in transformational discipleship. Weakness is one. It, it's people come to your Sunday school class this this um, this weekend and work's not going well and they feel they feel vulnerable and stressed man it is a it is an opportunity for transformation or it's the trial that they're going through um it's it's the divorce it's the uh, cancer it's the um, wayward son it's the um the betrayal it's the the pressure of life that the lord allows in a broken and fallen world to come our way. And one of, one of the reasons they come our way is because it, it opens us up to our, our need for him. And so it's one of the great things about leading a Sunday school class is that this week you'll have people who are rejoicing and this week you'll have people who are weeping and the Lord loves all of them. And oftentimes those who are, who are weeping are those who are most open for deep, deep work of the spirit in, in their hearts. So that's weakness. Uh, in, interdependence speaks to just the reality of being. This is this will be an assessment what teachers about. I mean, you are you are leading a you are leading a group of people that are learning. Hey, our, the Christian faith isn't me by myself. It's it's me in community. Dieter Bonhoeffer um, he said this one of my favorite quotes about leading a social class, being being a leader. Uh, sin wants to have a man by himself. Sin wants people alone. And so by you being a Sunday school teacher, you're helping people at, at, at the church not be alone, but be in, be in community. Um, one of my favorite places to visit with my wife on our favorite vacations, there's a place in, in Northern California above San Francisco, just right over, right over the Golden Gate Bridge called um, Near Woods, which is beautiful. It's incredible. There's these 300 feet in the air, um, sequoia trees and when I mean, you walk into the forest they stand so tall and, and you're like man these things are so strong and you go up and you read it I remember going up with my wife Kay and reading the sign and, and it says um notice these these trees they're three football fields high in the air some of them have been around 2,000 years I mean I'm looking at these trees thinking so you've been standing since Jesus walked this earth um and you haven't fallen all the weather patterns that have come and you haven't fallen all the Earthquakes that have hit the Bay Area and you haven't fallen. How have you stood? Not, not that I was actually talking to the tree. That was really just more in my head. But how, how, have you, how has this been able to stand? 
and the sign the sign there says um, n notice that even though that the, the tree stands 300 feet high the, the roots of the sequoia tree only go four feet deep it's just like man four feet deep roots and, and you know, think about people at your church that say, man, I just want to go deep. I just want to go deep. I just want to go deep. Um, the sequoia tree doesn't stand because it, it goes deep. The sequoia tree, as you keep reading the sign, you find out that it still stands because the roots, the sign says, even though they only are four feet deep, they intermingle. And so notice you'll never see a sequoia tree growing alone. They only grow in groves. They only grow in groves. And that's exactly what being a Sunday school teacher is. It's helping people grow in groves. It's helping people be able to be transformed as they're, you know, as they're in, as they're in community. The follow-up book to this, uh, Transformation Discipleship, was a book I wrote with Ed Setzer, a good friend of mine. And we did this, this massive study on people in a Sunday school class, or people in a small group. And this is, this is, the stats were crazy what we found. So if you look at people at First Houston, who are in a class versus those not in a class. If First Houston's like every other church we interviewed, and thousands of people filled out these surveys, those who are in a class compared to those who are not in a class, they share the gospel more regularly, they give more generously, um, they serve more frequently, they, they report that they confess their sins more regularly. But all the marks of being a disciple are much more evident in someone's life who's in community. And so you being, you being a teacher is not a small thing at all. And you may feel like, man, I'm not that good of a teacher. Listen, you getting people together in the word is not a small thing. It's a huge, huge thing what you're doing. And so that is a big part of posture. It's people being in community is a big part of posture. All right. Lastly is leaders. So it takes, it takes leaders to administer the truth to people while they're in a, a teachable posture. And so here you, you've heard this and, and this is so true that more than what is, is taught, uh, it's, it's your, uh, it's your faith that is taught. And so and if you want people in your, in your, your class to be excited about what God's doing in first Houston, you got to be excited about what God's doing. If you want people in your class to share the gospel at work, you've got to share the gospel at work. If you want people in your class to um, shepherd their families well, you've got to shepherd your family well. You, you really, the reality of leadership, and you know this, you reproduce what you are. And so that's why it's so critical for you as a leader uh, to shepherd your own, your own soul, to care for your own soul, to be, a, to be someone who loves Jesus in front of, in front of the group. So transformation is not, not guaranteed. It's a, it's, a work of, it's a work of God. God's the one who transforms us. But, you know, one of the, the, the uh, paradoxes of the Christian life is, you know, you got Philippians 2.12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You know, don't work for it. It's free, but work it out. So it feels like there's responsibility for us. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, verse 12. And then verse 13, for it's God who works in you according to his goodwill and pleasure. So it's, it's this, if Boa wrote about spiritual formation once in a book called Conform to His Image, and he said it's divine human synergy. So transformation is, is, is us disciplining ourselves, but ultimately God's work and leading us to the class in the same way. You, you do the work, but ultimately God's the one who does the work. You, you care for your group well, you teach your group well, but ultimately if transformation happens, it's God who does, it's God who does the work. And so, anyway, that's my challenge for you tonight. I'm, I'm honored to be able to spend a little bit of time with you. Uh, and Brad, I'll see if you, if, if you want to ask any questions, and I know you have a, have a schedule as well. No, that's awesome. And I know I have a few questions, too, just leading up to that. You guys, any questions you want to throw out there? They're talking a bunch tonight. <laughs> So I'll lead out. I'll throw this out there, Eric. So, you know, one of the difficulties that we have within the, the time frame is is I I feel like we have a difficulty trying to teach the lesson to get everything together, but even knowing um, on a Sunday we're we're 
located, you know, in central Houston. So there's a lot of people driving in. So connecting during the week oftentimes is difficult. Even knowing where someone's posture is. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. So, so what, what are some things that you would recommend implementing in, a, in our classes is even just a, a structure that, that our leaders can connect more with the posture of our people? That's great. That's a great question. Uh, to twofold, I would say, um, and I, I try to discipline myself on this as I as I teach and as I preach to to realize that there, you know, try even as I'm preparing it to mentally understand that there's people who are coming in to the group that uh, are at all different places, and and to 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 imagine and, and prayerfully as I prepare, think about those who are coming in hurting and those who are coming in. Uh, overwhelmed with with the burdens of life so that that causes the the person who's leading the teaching time uh, or facilitating that time to to be sensitive to all the different stages of life that people are are coming in from a structure part of the question you know it's it's uh, people do it differently in different contexts uh, but it's always good to try to get within the class to get things broken down to the smallest level possible where people have, whether it's called a care structure or, you know, a, a small group within the Sunday school class. And when my wife and I led, led a group for, for years uh, in Miami, we, we, we basically it, it grew groups like, you know, 60 or so people in the group that there's no way we could shepherd 60 people well. And so we would, uh, we broke it down into like 10 groups, you know, uh, of smaller and, and we cared for the leaders of those groups. And, and, and even we would get together sometimes for socials, but oftentimes people in those smaller groups would go to games together and, and, and we tried to distribute the care, uh, to more people in the, in the class. And so whether it's done with some official title that you, you have there at the church or, um, done differently in each, each group. The, I think it's really wise, depending on the size of each group, uh, to do, do all you can to distribute the care to as many people as possible. Um, it, it's, it's the Jethro to Moses conversation in Exodus 18. You know, man, Moses, you're killing yourself. This is, this is not good. You need, to, you need to find people and put them over fives, ten, fifties, hundreds. And, and so to, to in, involve other people in, in the care is it is to me the, the only way to be sure it's, it, it's done in a way that's possible because I mean, everyone in that room, everyone in that room has got, just like I do, I've got issues. <laughs> I've got things I'm wrestling with. I've got, I've got family. And so impossible for, um, for all, for any one of us to do all of the care. Yeah. Good. Any follow up questions from that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't really know how to ask this, but is there maybe like a format to lessons that you would recommend in terms of just balancing like the truth, posture, leadership, so that it doesn't lean towards maybe just like, I don't know, like a lesson that's entirely just about information, or, you know, maybe, I don't know if there are like any helpful tips you have, but the whole class just isn't maybe um, people being talked to. Yeah, that's great. Um, what, what I what I always try to do um, is when I when I'm looking at preparing the lesson, uh, you know, I'm using the curriculum or whatever it is uh, for for a sermon, uh, and I'm in that text is to to discipline myself to not only teach that text but to even for a little bit to pull up to the grand story of scripture, and then and and that that then helps me paint how this this really is connected to Christ and the only way we can fulfill the only way we can live this out is because of Christ in us. So that, that that's it's really the back to the trying to man, I, I gave this imperative. Let, let, let me bring it back up to the indicative. Uh, uh, otherwise otherwise it can it can feel like um, like you, your question, either information or behavior modification, just a list of things to do. And, and if I could chime in too, Anna, I would say, Eric, I think one of the biggest problems that, that we have is teachers teach too long. Mm. And so even though it's great information, I got you. 
Andy Stanley has a great quote that says, uh, churches aren't dying from lack of truth, right? So it's, it's not that teachers aren't teaching truth or aren't teaching great lessons, but I think one of the main things, Eric, in, in your study that I've appreciated, and even the idea of, of, of pipelines too, is, is if, if there's not an opportunity for your leadership and for you guys to connect relationally with other people, then all we're, all we're doing is, is giving them truth when they're coming with a, with a need. Yeah, it's good. So hopefully that truth will address, but, and, and I think with that, and, and this is so helpful in trying to know their posture. So we want to teach them truth. So you think about like, that's the teaching time, but then getting to know someone's posture is, are they going to be prayed for and prayed over? And when people come to our church in a posture of hurting or even a posture of joy, like you think about someone in your class who's getting, I wrote these things down, a new job mm. or a new house, or they just found out that they're having a baby. Are they been struggling with infertility? Hmm. Are they are they prayed over in class, even in a smaller group? It doesn't have to be the whole class. But are you broken down small enough where they yeah. feel like okay, there's some people that are carrying these burdens with me? And we would all say we value prayer. You know, no one would say no, that's not important. Do we value teaching? Yes, but but so often. Teaching is the, the number one thing that happens. And then we have some social time, but instead of allowing people to connect socially through guided questions and discussions from the teacher, or even if it's just, hey, how we're going to care for each other by praying for each other. And how do we implement this and having your class discuss it in smaller groups? But that's where it's so important that teachers and directors that you guys are on the same page. In this. And because my biggest fear is that people are coming to our church in a posture of wanting to receive. Like the couple that I shared that have been divorced, they come to your class, they're wanting, they're, they're going to be vulnerable. They're not going to let the whole class know, but maybe they'll let some people know. They need someone to pray for them and to minister to them, and it doesn't happen, and they're only taught, hmm. only taught truths. And so I would, I would say that a big part of that is in your format is, is that has got to be in teachers. I know that you're, you're putting time in to prep your lesson, and so you feel like you need to get it all across. But if all we do is present the truth without ministering to people, we've really missed your role in leadership, you know, to minister to people and to develop those relationships. Does that, does that make sense? Really Eric, what do, you, what do you think about that? Man, it's so good. And, and I, when you said infertility, I thought about um, the group we were in in Miami and, and uh, that was us. We, we wrestled with like three years before we, and it was so painful. You know, all your friends are having kids and you're, you actually are rejoicing with, with them, but at the same time you're, um, you're broken because you're, it's not working for you. It, the, you know, you thought it was going to happen fast and it's been multiple years and why is it not happening? And you're seeing doctors. And uh, even before I told, I was responsible, I was executive pastor. So I was, I was leading all the staff, but even before I told them, I told, um, even before I told some of the pastors, we told our, our class and it was in that smaller group that they gathered around and prayed for us and would check up on us. And, uh, I remember that more than I remember the lessons, you know, I remember that, that, um, the time that they, and they cared and they loved and I'm, I'm, I'm forever grateful for that. And, and so I was, I was that even, even being the leader, I was that guy, uh, who was broken and needed people around me. And so that, People probably wouldn't even thought that. And there's people that come in every week that more than they need just the, the lesson, they need the, they need the time uh, and the care, you know? Yeah, that's good. What are y'all's thoughts about that? Yeah, Matt? Um, I've been told by several people who have come in, visited with Don a few times, they've, they've uh, left and basically said, hey, you know, I, I felt the vulnerability of leadership. Like when they're up talking in front of class, they share their parenting fails of the week. I mean, the honest moments of their marriage, there was a, a, a fight on the way to, to church that night, that they had a disagreement about something, whatever. And the people that were visiting left, came back the next week and shared, the reason I'm back is because hmm. this feels like a community. This feels yeah. like vulnerable people. That's cool. Right together. Yeah. Like, the people in this, and there have been plenty of times that there's been a need, been very obvious that a couple struggling or infertility or being sent off to another church or whatever the case and we just 
stop class and go pray over I love like, that. Those are great signs of a good community, especially when you're hearing visitors share that with you. But it did not, it doesn't come naturally. It comes from the leadership being themselves open and vulnerable. Absolutely. I have really, truly appreciated. That's one of the reasons we stuck in the class for so long. Yeah. Is because the initial uh, directors were very, they did honest moments. Yeah. And it was something you could expect every week. Mm -hmm. And you could just laugh with them and, you know, like, we're, we're not perfect. We're not perfect. We're doing life together. Yeah. No, that's good. So, awesome. Yeah, so, so something we've been, been trying, and I guess we've been trying for like the last six weeks and it seems to be working well, is we've kind of cut announcements to the bare minimum, started right on time, give our teachers 40 minutes of instruction and setting aside the last 10 or 15 minutes of class and just praying around our tables, sharing concerns. So we've got a group right there that's four to six people. You kind of gotten to know each other a little bit if you didn't already over some discussion questions in the lesson, but kind of yeah. eliminated the small talk of people just waiting for class to start at the beginning and diving straight into those real relationships at the end yeah. of that. And people can expect that prayer time at the end. Yeah, that's so, good. I would say kind of, to give some direction in that. So if people are visitors, if you're going to start implementing some of this that, hey, not everyone has to pray. Tell them don't go in a circle because if it gets to them and they don't feel comfortable praying with the other three or four people, it's going to be really awkward so that you, you give them guided direction. Like, Hey, we're going to have a prayer time, break up in groups of four and two of y'all pray. Two people volunteer to pray. Cause if you start doing the circle thing, you're going to have a hard time having visitors come in that'll feel comfortable doing that. That's good. Thanks for sharing that. Anyone else? Awesome. Any other questions? All right, Eric, we're grateful for you, buddy. Man, thank you so much for jumping in with us tonight. Man, I'm honored to be invited. I appreciate y'all. That's good. I'll be in Nashville, Lifeway, next week, spring break, the 11th. So oh, sweet, man. Have a chance to run into you. Yeah, yeah come by. Come by my office. I'd love, love to talk for a bit. That sounds good. Appreciate you. Have a great night, buddy. See you, man. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.